What's going on everybody? I'm Johnny Brook. Welcome back to another Crafted Workshop video. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you how to build this farmhouse style dining table and matching bench. I have detailed plans available for these if you're interested in building a set of your own. Those will be uh, on my website. I have a link in my video description below if you want to check those out. Uh, but I built this out of really basic construction lumber, uh, southern yellow pine for the top and Douglas fir for the base. And all of the wood costs less than 200 bucks for the table and two of these benches. So stay tuned. Let's get started with the build. My friends John and Katie wanted a farmhouse table and benches for their new house and I offered to help build a set for them. John and I built this table and a matching set of benches out of southern yellow pine 2x10s and Douglas fir 4x4s from my local home center. I started by breaking down the parts to rough size, leaving everything long so it could be trimmed to final size later. I used 2x10s for the top even though the final width of my top boards was 7 and 3 quarters of an inch. And this extra width allowed me to remove the rounded edges from the pieces as well as cut away any damage to the edges of the board. To remove the rounded edges, I used my jointer to square up one side, then ripped off the other edge of the table saw. These steps are definitely optional and certainly aren't required, but they really make the top look a lot cleaner if you have access to these kind of tools. After getting rid of the rounded edges, I flattened the boards at the jointer and planer. This removes any of the cupping or twists from the boards and leaves a really clean surface. Again, this isn't required, but it makes the boards look a hundred times better than they do when you get them from the store. Next, I laid out the lines for the dowels that I used to align the top boards during the glue up. I used this Rockler dowel drilling jig and it worked out great. I typically use my domino for this, but the dowel jig went almost as fast and the results were pretty much identical. With the dowel holes drilled, we moved on to gluing up the top. As you can see, the dowels really help keep things aligned during the glue up. And I also discovered this Rockler glue roller during this build, and it is an absolute pleasure during these panel glue ups. It applies the perfect amount of glue and is much faster than using a brush to spread the glue. Once the top dried, I trimmed the end square using my track saw. A circular saw with a straight edge would work just as well here though. And since I left my boards a little long, I didn't need to worry about them being perfectly aligned during the glue up, and I just trimmed them to length here. With the edges trimmed square, it was time to install the breadboard ends, and let's take a second to talk about breadboard ends and what they're designed to do. All right, so let's take a second to talk about breadboard ends and why they even exist. So uh, first of all, a lot of people just like the look of covering up the ingrain on the top panels. It does provide a nice clean look, and I think that's one of the major reasons why people do breadboard ends is because they like the way it looks. Uh, the other nice function of a breadboard end is that this piece, the breadboard itself, is gonna probably stay pretty flat and it can keep the top panel itself from cupping over time. Let's talk about how you're supposed to install a breadboard in. I see a ton of people, especially in this kind of farmhouse style table, people who are just kind of getting into woodworking, install these in a way that does not allow for wood movement. And that is one of the critical factors when installing a breadboard in. If you just use pocket screws and just screw your breadboard in onto the center panel here, it's not going to allow room for this panel to expand and contract along its width and you're probably gonna end up with either some bowing or cracking or just something going wrong with your top. So I've marked here how the pieces of wood here are going to move. Uh, wood typically moves across its width quite a bit more than it does along its length. Here on the center panel, you can see that the movement is going to occur in this direction, but on the breadboard, since it's perpendicular, running perpendicularly to the center panel, it's going to move in this direction. That means that you need to make some sort of allowance for the wood movement of the center panel to move within whatever joinery method you use in the breadboard ends. So for my breadboard ends, I'm gonna use my Domino XL just because I have it, it's super, super quick and creates a really nice sturdy breadboard end. I realize most of you do not have access to that tool, so let's go over some other ways of creating breadboard ends. Uh, the most popular is probably just gonna be a router and you can create some sort of kind of tongue and groove, a, a groove in the breadboard end itself and a tongue on the end of the center panel and that will allow the panel to expand and contract along its width. Uh, you can do that with a basic router and edge guide. Uh, April 
Wilkerson recently built a walnut dining table and did a great job explaining this using really basic tools. So I'll have a link in the video description if you want to check that out. Uh, there are some other options. You could certainly cut it by hand if you're good at using hand tools, uh, both very accessible. I mean, you can get a cheap used router and get this done really easily. So uh, that is breadboard ends in a nutshell. Hopefully that was helpful. Let's get back to the build. So for my breadboard ends, I first laid out the locations for the dominoes. I used 12 millimeter by 140 millimeter dominoes and used five of them on each end of the tabletop. The process when using dominoes for a breadboard end is to first cut the mortises on the center panel on the tight setting. Next on the breadboard ends, cut the center mortise on the tight setting and then cut the rest of the mortises on the loose setting. This will allow the top panel to expand and contract freely while keeping the breadboard centered on the center panel. With the mortises cut, I glued the dominoes into the mortises in the center panel, making sure to wipe away any of the glue squeeze out since that would interfere with the fit later on. And next I laid out the hole locations for the dowel pins which will hold the breadboard ends in place. I used 3 8 inch dowels and drilled the holes all the way through the breadboards at the drill press. I installed the breadboard in and marked the location of the holes on the dominoes using a brad point drill bit. And I also marked the overhanging area of the breadboards since I kept them a little long up until this point. I trimmed the breadboards to their final length at the miter saw and tested the fit to make sure they were even. With the breadboards trimmed to length, I could mark the hole locations on the dominoes. I used a process called draw boring on the breadboards, which means that I offset the holes in the dominoes slightly towards the center panel. That means that once the dowels are driven in, this offset will help pull the breadboards tight against the center panel. I drilled the holes using a 3 8 inch drill bit and made sure to widen the holes in the dominoes that went with the loose mortises in the breadboard. And finally, I used a draw bore pin to expand the holes slightly, which just allows the dowels to go in a little easier. Next, it was time to glue the breadboard ends in place. Only the center domino receives glue, as this is the only tight joint on the ends, and the dowel in the center domino is also the only one that received glue. The other dowels only received glue at the very end just to keep them in place in the holes. You also might notice that I sharpened the ends of the dowels with a pencil sharpener and this really helped them go into the drawboard holes nice and easy. With all the dowels in place, I trimmed them flush using a flush trim saw and the breadboards were done. Once they had a chance to dry, I went to work getting the top flattened. Using the dowels for alignment really helped keep the panel flat during glue up. So I really just needed to make a few passes with my low angle jack plane to get it nice and smooth. After planing and a little card scraping, I sanded the entire surface with 120 grit sandpaper followed by 150 grit. Since we stained the pieces, I didn't go past 150 grit just to allow the stain to get into the pores of the wood a little easier. Finally, I chamfered all the edges using a block plane and this is so much simpler than setting up a router and makes way less of a mess. So with the top basically done, we moved on to building the base. Again, we used untreated Douglas fir 4x4 from the home center, so they looked a little rough right from the store. I sent them through the planer, taking off about an eighth of an inch from each face, which really cleaned them up. This also removed the rounded corners, which I'm not a big fan of. Next, I cut the base pieces to size at the miter saw. The legs are made up of four pieces, a top apron that has 90 degree cuts on each end, and then two legs and a stretcher, which have 10 degree cuts on each end. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I do have detailed plans available for this project that walks you through each cut step-by-step step on both the dining table and benches. And if you're interested, there's a link in the video description below. To assemble the base, I again called on my trusty domino. However, there are plenty of other methods to put the base together. Dowel joinery is a great option, which I'll show later in this video when we build the bench bases as well as just plain old screws. A few six inch screws in each joint would give quite a bit of holding power and you could easily fill in the screw holes if you don't like that look or just leave them exposed. That is one of the advantages of this rustic style. So once the leg joinery was cut, we did a test assembly of the base and marked the length of the truss supports. 
These are cut at a 55 degree angle, which is totally arbitrary. If your miter saw won't go to 55 degrees, you could definitely make these at 45 degrees and they would still look really nice. I cut the trusses to size on the miter saw and then I added domino mortises to them as well. And with the joinery on all the pieces cut, we did a quick dry assembly to make sure everything fit properly. With everything fitting nice and snug, I went back and cut a second domino mortise in each location so that we could use two dominoes per joint. This made for an incredibly strong base. So with all of the joinery cut for the base, it was time for the glue up. So we decided to tackle the glue up in two phases. In the first phase, we assembled each leg structure and the center truss structure as three separate assemblies. This allowed us to really focus on getting rid of any gaps Plus, I didn't have enough clamps to glue everything up at once. And once those three assemblies dried, we glued them together to form the final base. After the base dried, we gave it a good sanding, starting with 80 grit and working up to 150 grit, and then temporarily attached the base to the top so that we could move the table to John's house for finishing. We centered the base on the bottom of the top, and I drove in a few 4-inch screws along the center of the table. For the stain, we used a water locks product called True Tone, and True Tone is a color infused tongue oil, so I mixed the True Tone in a 4 to 1 ratio with water locks original sealer and finish to make it more of a wipe on finish, and then we brushed on the stain with a foam brush. We let it sit for a minute or two, keeping the surface wet, and then wiped off the excess with a paper towel. And I was really impressed with how evenly the stain went on, especially considering this is pine, a wood notorious for splotching. Thanks to Waterlocks for sponsoring this video, and check out the link in the video description if you'd like to learn more about Waterlocks. So with the table basically done, let's move on to building the benches. Obviously, we built these pieces simultaneously, but I thought it might be easier to follow if I split up the two builds to keep things separated. The benches are essentially identical to the table, only smaller, so I'm just going to kind of skim through the process. I squared up the boards for the top on the jointer, table saw, and planer, just like I did on the table. And with the boards squared up, I laid out the marks for the dowels. And here's where things got a little painful. This board fell off of my workbench and landed on edge squarely on my big toe. Luckily, it didn't break the toe, but I have a gnarly looking oh, bruise, man. and I guess I need to look into some proper footwear for the shop besides tennis shoes. While I inspected the damage on the toe, John soldiered on and drilled the dowel holes, and after the holes were drilled, we glued up the bench tops. So while we're gluing up the tops, let's talk about the other sponsor of this week's video, Rockler. I used a ton of Rockler products during this build, including their dowel drilling jig, glue application master set, and their tabletop fasteners, and I'll have links to all the items I used in the video description below. Rockler has got tons of great tools and accessories for your next build, and they're always coming up with new and innovative ideas that help make your woodworking both more efficient and more enjoyable. Thanks again to Rockler for sponsoring this build. So after the glue dried on the top, I squared up the ends on the miter saw and then installed the breadboard ends just like I did on the tabletop, again with dominoes draw boring the ends into place. You might also notice that I tried to use quarter inch dowels on one of the benches, but they proved to be too small to survive the draw boring process, so I definitely recommend a minimum of a 3 8 inch dowel. With the tops done, we moved on to building the bases, which again are the same as the table bases, just smaller. I did want to illustrate how you could use dowels for the joinery on the base, so we used dowels rather than dominoes on one of the bases. And the key here when using dowel joinery is to completely immobilize the base so that it doesn't move around when you're drilling the dowel holes. I used one inch dowels, which provided a ton of strength. I drilled the holes with a one inch spade bit, going through the sides of the legs into the stretcher, and also through the top apron into the legs. As you can see, you end up with a really nice looking, super strong leg with no screw holes to fill. Since we were in a time crunch, I used dominoes for the rest of the joinery on the bench bases, and again, the process was the same as the table base. We did make the mistake of trying to glue up the entire base in one go, and this was way more stressful than it needed to be, and also caused some gaps since we couldn't get the clamping pressure in the right spots. After the glue dried, we gave everything a good sanding and then attached the base to the top with 4 inch screws, again temporarily just for moving to John's for finishing. We used the same Waterlocks True Tone stain, 
and then John followed up with three coats of Waterlock's original sealer and finish on the table and benches. The last step in the build was to cut the slots for the Rockler tabletop fasteners. And these are really cool. They allow the tops of the table and benches to expand and contract seasonally without restriction. And I cut the slots using a biscuit joiner, but there are a ton of other options for cutting these slots. You could use a table saw. Basically, you just need a slot that's evenly spaced from the top of the piece. I used the four inch screws again in the center of the tops since I wanted the tops to expand from the center and then used two tabletop fasteners at each end of the benches and used two tabletop fasteners at each end of the table. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. This one was a lot of fun. It was kind of nice to take construction lumber, which is kind of ratty looking from the store and put it through all the machines and make it look really nice and clean. I'm just super happy with the way the top and base turned out. I think it looks gorgeous. I think this piece is gonna last for years to come. And I'm hoping John and Katie enjoy it a bunch. So again, I have plans available on my website. I've got links in the video description below if you wanna check those out. Also, big shout out to my Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for the continued support. And last, I also have links in the video description to all the tools and materials I used for this build. Thanks again for watching guys and until next time, happy building.